Press yeah. Club. We are, of course, and making it a time of a great health challenge. Just like last and year, greater breakthroughs we are, of course, when it comes to technological advancement. Of a great health challenge in relation to the and greater breakthroughs when it comes to technology. It is also a time when the media sector in relation is to the greater challenges, place. including issues of job. It is also a time when the media sector is closure facing greater challenges, in place, including major issues advancements of job losses in, in the growing sector. Growing media sector. The closure of publications. Growing questions in South Africa major polarized in growing and the politicized media sector. journalism. Growing practice. questions into South Africa's and polarized innovation. And politicized by research and development practices. within the media and technology. And of course, space. innovations driven by questions research and development on the state of the, the media, media cannot be swept space. under the carpet. As the questions is too on the state of the media cannot democracy. be swept under the carpet. It is As on the those professions is too that today's lecture for any becomes democracy. important and timely. It is on those bases this morning that we are coming together to important listen to one of South African activists. This and morning, we are coming together uh, to Dr. listen to one of the Walsh activists addressing us under the and leading public intellectuals, the role of the media uh, in the digital Walsh age, addressing us far under the theme, serving the, as the, the voice role of the media of the dispossessed the age, and how far will it go in serving of change as the voice real democracy. of the dispossessed as I stated, and as a channel they address of change timely and real democracy. Not only because mm. as I stated, of the significance they address is timely of the Kobosa Memorial Lecture in relation of the significance in relation of the Kowalza Memorial Lecture in relation Black Wednesday to and media freedom. In relation it is, it is also timely because it allows Black Wednesday us to and media freedom. The changes it is, that have it is happened also within timely the profession because it allows us to reflect on the changes that have course, happened within the profession the in the last name 44 years. Help us in reflecting on of the changes course, that have happened. Who either than the Kowalza name could help us in reflecting on the changes that have happened and whether the trade has deviated or not from its core purpose. Wildly known as Injam Nyayama among his peers, Len Kalane, his former colleague, notes, and I quote, Koboza had almost single-handedly charted a new course in black journalism, a new form of black journalism dealing with the social and political issues at hand to spur on the struggle against apartheid and injustices. The global's a name is thus to us. The global's a name is thus important to us as it allows us to reflect on the political question of journalism and its continued relevance into the social healing, social democracy, and the role of the media. Program director, perhaps you can allow me to make a few further comments about the history of this project. It's relevant to Black Wednesday and its association with the Gobosa family, and more particularly, Mr. Percy Gobosa. Since the inauguration of the annual Percy Kobosa Memorial Lecture in 2011, commemorating Black Wednesday when the world newspaper uh, was shut down. And what we have then done since then, we have had a bursary that we've been giving to our students. And basically the bursary has been we had had to award it to one of our honors media students who has excelled in their studies. This year, we are most grateful to the UNISA Foundation for their continued support when it comes to this initi initiative. Uh, but most importantly, it is important that we say that the event was conceived and still remains a focal arena of reflecting on journalistic behavior, developments in the profession, and thus must represent the spirit of journalism and it must be representative of the industry and must facilitate the discussion of relevant and timely media topics. And so with those few words, program director, I welcome everyone to this event. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, that was Professor Jali welcoming us to today's proceedings. We thank you very much, Prof, for also sketching a little bit of a background to this annual. Thank you very much. It is now my honor to introduce to you our keynote speaker for today, 
a phenomenal man in his own right, Dr. Sizwe Mpofu Walsh. He's an activist and an author, and he will be presenting the 11th Boboza Memorial Lecture for 2021. Dr. Mpofu Walsh is a postdoctoral fellow at the VERS Institute for Social and Economic Research. He holds a Doctor of Philosophy degree in international from Oxford University. His first books called Democracy and Delusion, 10 Myths in South African Politics, uh, that was published in 2017, won the City Press Tafelberg Nonfiction Award. His second book, The New Apartheid, was published in 2021 and has been one of the best selling books in South Africa this year. It's now my pleasure to ask Dr. Bob Walsh to address us today. Thank you, sir. Please unmute. Thank you very much, Mr. Charlie. Uh, it's a singular honor to be invited today to address the 11th annual Percy Koboza Memorial Lecture. And as one of the younger speakers of the 11 at this event, uh, uh, the honor is only amplified. Uh, I would very much like to thank members of the organizing committee from the National Press Club, uh, you, Mr. Charlie, uh, as program director, uh, the College of Human Sciences at UNISA, as well as the UNISA Foundation, uh, my esteemed panelists and interlocutors, uh, with whom I look forward to engaging after this talk, Prof. Khadebe, uh, Mr. Chengeng, uh, Ms. Makopeni. It's a great honor to be able to speak alongside you today. And of course, we remember uh, Val Boyer and all those who we've lost in this terrible last 18 months of grief. Thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you to you all uh, who are watching today, students, journalists, members of the public and other interested parties. Thank you for your time and attention today. People must be aggressive in their efforts to transform an unjust society into a just society. We will have to encourage a vigorous campaign to remove racial discrimination in all its forms. These are the words of Percy Koboza. In a nutshell, Koboza urges us to be aggressive in tackling injustice, to mount and marshal a noble aggression. Because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. It was in Percy Koboza's time, and it is today. And it's in that spirit that I begin in the commemoration of the life of Percy Koboza, our journalistic and political ancestor, and in which I salute his family today. We must be aggressive in, it, in tackling injustice because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. And along that theme today, I'd like to expand and I'll do so in three parts. First, I want to question the extent to which we as a country over the last three decades have in actual fact uprooted and destroyed and defeated apartheid. Then, in the second part, I would like to relate the residual problems of apartheid faced by South African society to the established media, and particularly the private sphere of South African media. And following this, I will then explore how the advent of new digital forms of media further complicate the persistent injustices and inequalities which continue to dog our democratic order. 
And in a nutshell, I will be contending along the lines of Utatu Koboza that we must be aggressive in tackling injustice because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. So let me begin then by reflecting on the extent to which our declared victory over apartheid in 1994 can be considered an un, uh, unbridled success. Speaking at the time, speaking of the time that he spent as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, Percy Koboza made the following observation. For the first time in his life, he said, he could distinguish between what was right and what was wrong. This was of his time spent away from South Africa at Harvard, looking onto our country at a time of great ferment and tumult in our political life, the mid to late 1970s. He continued, the thing that scared me the most was that I had accepted injustice and discrimination as part of our traditional way of life. After my year, the things that I had accepted made me angry. It is because of this, and here he moves on to talking about the reorientation of his editorial predisposition and his newly renewed and vigorous activism as he returned to South Africa's shores. He said, it is because of this that the character of my newspaper, The World, has changed tremendously. It took Koboza leaving South Africa's shores to look back at South African society afresh and with new eyes. And in doing so, he was able to abandon the myths of abiding influence that created the familiar bubble which makes us numb to the injustice and the oppression that characterizes and characterized South African life. And in that spirit, is it not time for us to look at South Africa anew, to abandon some of the myths which we have inherited and to look at our society in all its injustice and inequality with new eyes that we might, as Koboza suggested, fundamentally reorient our actions. The celebration of South African democracy and the constitutional order which followed have in many ways, I would argue, clouded our vision. We have become inured to the destitution, racialized and gendered suffering around us as we celebrate our so-called miracle. And in this celebration, we have lost sight of the residual effects of apartheid that still continue to dog our society, our democracy and our country. And it bears remembering that the Apartheid Project was a project on a monumental scale and that the legislative dimensions of Apartheid, in other words, the laws and the statutes that were enacted between 1948 and 1994, were only one piece in a much broader puzzle which sought to touch, oppress and affect the life of every South African who was deemed, quote unquote, other. When the legislative barriers of apartheid fell in 1994, this did not dismantle the larger edifice of apartheid that continued in place in the economic spheres of life, in the way that we organize 
space in cities, towns, and rural areas in the way that private realms of law continue sometimes to protect private interests of power, in the way that we punish criminally in our society and disproportionately incarcerate, and also, it would appear, in the rise of new technologies. The goal of apartheid, according to its planners, economists, and ideologues, was to implant apartheid so deeply into South African society that no democratic government would be capable of uprooting it. And in the late 1980s, many apartheid planners conceded and realized that a, d a democratic government was on the horizon. Yet they were confident that apartheid had been so deeply seeded in South African life that the mere imposition of a democratic government would only add a glossy sheen to a deeper structural problem. And I'm not the only person who has questioned in recent times whether apartheid is still with us or not. In his new book, Prisoners of the Past, Professor Stephen Friedman notes, the compromise of the 1990s settled only one question, the denial of citizenship rights. But it was not the only issue. The power which is wielded outside government does not disappear because everyone can vote. How have we lost sight of the term apartheid? How has it fallen off our agenda? How have we stopped speaking its name when apartheid knows our names so well? Why have we started to use euphemisms like inequality, poverty, and unemployment when we know that the problem is apartheid oppression? Why have we sanitized the situation of racialized and gendered injustice in our country in order to ameliorate and placate those who benefit from the continued presence of apartheid in our lives. Percy Corboza was not one to use euphemisms and to sanitize his characterization of South African society. At the time of his life, many people suggested that apartheid was reforming, changing, and becoming better. But in an article called South Africa, a Black Viewpoint, written in 1978, Komoza observed, we all know that we have come a long way from the undisguised racism of D.F. Malan and his pure race policies. These were followed by Dr. Furvut's dream of separate freedoms, and these in turn by Forster's policy of multinational development. The state has now been reached where political semantics of the day center on plural democracies. But Goboza went on to state that no matter how racial discrimination had taken on new guises and disguises, it was fundamental that all those who read his work realized that the condition of the presence of apartheid in whatever form it existed needed to be uprooted and defeated and that the changing forms of apartheid and the changing language of apartheid traced back to a fundamental, structural, and evil system. Do we fall victim to the new language which deflects from the fundamental crisis of apartheid's continued presence even in a democratic order? And have we allowed new vocabularies to distract us from the crisis of apartheid's ability to adapt, remake itself, and renew itself, even around the democratic constraints, which were placed in 1994. 
we must be aggressive in tackling injustice because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. I'd like to move now then to tracing patterns of apartheid in established media, especially in the private sphere of South Africa, because I believe firmly that apartheid did not die, rather it was privatized. And so we need to turn our attention to the private realm, to those who wield private power, to understand how apartheid has taken on a new life in the current moment. At the end of it all, apartheid is an ideology of minority control. A situation in which despite the demographic makeup of South Africa and the predominance of black South Africans, in the spaces that matter where real decisions are made and real choices are taken, the demographic majority becomes a minority. Or in the words of one of our great public intellectuals, Ukogo Obri Machikri, a demographic majority can become a cultural minority. And when we cast our eye to the spaces that matter in the private realm of South Africa's media, how much we see that the majority is still the minority, both in terms of race, but also, and extremely crucially in our time, in terms of gender. Let's have a look at some of the demographics of the spaces that matter in South Africa. In terms of the editors of South Africa's newspaper, according to the latest published State of the Newsroom report from the Witt School of Journalism, even when we include the SABC, uh, I will also reflect on the worrying patterns despite the advances made at the SABC in terms of racial representation and gender representation. But these statistics include the SABC and nonetheless prove the point. But let's come on to the editors of newspapers for now. 49% of South Africa's newspaper editors are black African. This is no reason for celebration. In fact, it is a shocking indictment on how little has changed in the South African media space in three decades. While 28% are white. How in our so-called miracle have we allowed a situation in which three decades later, we have a vast and disproportionate overrepresentation of white voices in our editorial spaces and a chronic underrepresentation of black voices. And I'm afraid the situation gets deeper when we look at questions of gender. Because staying on the editorial positions at South African newspapers for a moment, 67% of newspaper editors are gendered as men and a meager 33% as women. And if we were to overlay those two statistics, we would find that the representation of black women's voices in particular was so chronically underrepresented that it would constitute a monumental crisis, a deprivation of the most important perspective that we can have at this moment, and a silencing of the crucial voices which deserve to have the greatest amount of space in our public debate at the moment. In what world is it a miracle that we are still so far behind representing black voices and the voices of women around the tables and the editorial discussions that matter. Let's come to the question of ownership and the boardroom. And let's look at what the situation tells us. Of course, 
I might add and enter the caveat that these data are dynamic, they shift over time, and they move 1% in, in different directions. But the trends are what, what matters here. In terms of members of boards of media companies, and again, I think the progress made at the SABC inflates these figures because it includes the SABC. But let's look at the, the numbers. Black representation is at a staggering and a shocking 39%. White representation is at 30%, still nearly rivaling black representation. Again, I ask, in the spaces that matter, where real decisions are made about what agendas should be set, what should be said, and what perspectives should be privileged. There is a desperate and chronic underrepresentation of black voices and a desperate and worrying overrepresentation of white voices. And so when we celebrate victory over apartheid, my question is how have we defeated the persistent patterns of racial inequality when South Africa's media landscape has failed in three decades to even begin to overturn the momentum of apartheid patterns of power? And I would stress again that if we look at questions of gender around the boardroom table, the crisis deepens because we have 72% of men around the boardroom table in South African media companies, while we only have 28% of women's voices represented. And we can probably halve that when we think of the number of black women's voices represented. And so although there are notable exceptions which rise to prominence in the public debate, and, and we think that things are changing and things are fundamentally moving in the right direction, we have not been aggressive enough, and I talk here of a noble aggression, a peaceful aggression in, in the line of Percy Koboza, but an unapologetic aggression to attack injustice, because injustice is stubborn and aggressive in its oppression. An old chief was teaching her granddaughter about life. A fight is going on inside me, she said to the girl. It is a terrible fight and it is between two wolves. One is evil. He is anger, envy, sorrow and regret. The other wolf is good. He is joy peace, love, and hope. The same fight is going on inside you, the grandmother told her granddaughter, and every other person too. The granddaughter thought about this for a minute and then asked her grandmother, which wolf will win? The grandmother replied, the one you feed. Well, we might well say that there are two wolves at the door of South Africa today. One is injustice, one is oppression, one is inequality, all linked to the legacy and the life, the ongoing life of apartheid. Another is hope, it's liberation, it's equality and freedom. The one that will win is the one that we feed. Which one are we feeding in the South African media today? Having reflected on some of the problems still confronting South African media linked to the life of apartheid and the afterlife of apartheid, I would now like to turn to the third and final section of my discussion, which considers questions of the digital media. Because if one thing did change in 1994, it was a major technological transformation. In fact, as South Africa inaugurated its democratic moment, there were profound 
digital shifts taking place the world over. And so South African democracy coincided with the emergence of an increasingly digital human life. The internet was just becoming ubiquitous at the very moment that South Africa was becoming a democracy. And so our democratic life has run in parallel with the increased digitality of human life itself. And this, in many ways, has characterized and, and bears on the way that apartheid has itself taken on a digital life in South African democracy today and in South African media. And we ought to reflect not only on this process, but what the future may hold in terms of the next evolution of patterns of digital apartheid. For one thing, the rise of increasingly algorithmic news and media technologies is a question which increasingly confronts all democracies and South Africa is no exception. And what I mean by this is the increased way in which machines are taking crucial parts of the decision-making process in what we see and setting the agenda. What do I mean by this? Let's take a look at Twitter, that well-known public sphere. And by the way, I might take this opportunity to remind you to tweet about this event, uh, no matter how ironic that might be. But we might as well use Twitter while we criticize it. What do you see when you open Twitter? Certainly not the last tweet that was posted chronologically. You see the tweet when you open Twitter that Twitter thinks according to its algorithm, in other words, its recipe, will engage you the most based on your history of interactions with other people on Twitter, based on what Twitter thinks your political preferences might be, based on a great wealth of data about you that Twitter probably has access to. Far from an editor sitting in a room deciding what will set your agenda for the day, Twitter's algorithm decides what will engage you and probably anger you the most so that you will participate in the, the babble of the day. Now, we may have access to South Africa's boardrooms. We might be able to change those power dynamics that I spoke about earlier. We can change who edits South Africa's news, newspapers over time. But our grasp over the ingredients of the Twitter algorithm, or the Instagram algorithm, or Facebook's algorithm, or indeed Google's algorithm, is even further away than it was during apartheid. Not only is that power wielded outside of South Africans' control, but it's often wielded outside of democratic control. And the intense concentrations of corporate power outside our borders pose new challenges and new threats in terms of setting the news agenda. But it's not just a question of a lack of control and a lack of accountability. Because the new digital lives that increasingly dictate social media and influence traditional media itself also map onto apartheid power. We seem to have lost um, Dr. Siswem Bofu Walsh, who was delivering this year's account of the 11th Pesit Oboza Memorial Lecture. While we are trying to get him back on, please remember to follow the conversation on Twitter by following the National Press Club uh, Twitter account, as well as the UNISA accounts for update and the hashtags to be used this year. It's Black Wednesday, and the other one is Pesit Oboza 
11. Dr. Cizue Mpofu Walsh, are you able to hear us perhaps? All right. Um, Perhaps while we wait for him to reconnect, uh, may I take this opportunity to introduce myself. I am Musid Mohele and I will be facilitating the questions and answer session. But before I do so, we are indeed delighted to be joined by three respondents to the lecture and I will quickly introduce them before we actually give them an opportunity to give their remarks to the lecture. First, I have Professor Mandla Khatebe, who is a communications professional with over two decades of work experience in industries such as accounting and auditing, financial services, information and communication technology, higher education, retail and public sector. Currently, he's an associate professor in Department of Strategic Communication at the University of Johannesburg. I'm glad to see that uh, Dr. Cizum Bofu Walsh was able to rejoin us. Um, I'll hand over to him and then we'll proceed with uh, the next uh, uh, item of the agenda shortly after his lecture. Over to you, Dr. Cizum Bofu Walsh. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Mochele, and I hasten to add that I'm, I was drawing to a close, but I would also like to say that as soon as I started, started talking about technology companies, uh, my teams crashed. So uh, I won't say sabotage, but, uh, but I'll leave it at that. Um, so as I, as I draw to a close, I was rounding off this point about uh, technology and algorithms and their ability to dictate our lives. And uh, I was reflecting on the way that this interacts with the apartheid power. So I'll close that point and, and conclude. When algorithms decide what you should see, who you should interact with, and what will en engage you the most, in a divisive political climate like South Africa's, a racially divided climate and a climate of great gender oppression and other forms of oppression. These algorithms are not innocent and interact with social problems in South Africa. Let me give you one brief example to illustrate the point. Many social media algorithms are based on a principle called homophily. Homophily combines the same homo and love, philly, love of the same, the likelihood that you are prone to interact with people who are like you. So Facebook and Twitter and Instagram will suggest content to you from people who look like you, who live near you, who believe the things that you believe. Now, when we think about South Africa and, for example, the spatial segregation, which we continue to see, digital social media algorithms suggesting people who happen to live close to you is not an innocent and abstract question of, of you being more likely to interact with people who are like you. It actually reinforces patterns of racial segregation in the digital world so that the physical problems of oppression that we see in South African society become mirrored in the digital echo chambers that we create for each other. And so we need to think very carefully about the ways in which new digital technologies can expand our freedom and indeed allow us to interact on a platform like this and organize and mobilize, but also how they can re-entrench problems of apartheid inequality, and in fact, give them new life. And we only need to look at the way that far-right interest groups in South Africa have harnessed digital technologies to create an ecosystem of misinformation and disinformation, which has even risen to the point of challenging the, re the rectitude of apartheid itself to realize that we are in for an important digital battle ahead. So in our digital lives, as in traditional media, we must be aggressive in tackling injustice because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. I'd like to conclude then with the words of Percy Oboza. And in a 1977 lecture uh, delivered at the South African Institute for International Affairs, 
He said the following, it is no use people telling me that job reservation is no more applicable when that law is still gracing our statute book. It is no use to know that people are saying that races can play soccer together now, while the Group Areas Act, which makes it an offense for people to play soccer together, is still on the statute book. It is no use telling me about changes in South Africa when I am still subjected to those humiliations of arbitrary arrest because I forget my pass at home. It is no use talking to me about change when the white man still decides what is or what is not good for me. It is no use trying to draw the sympathy of the outside world and to say increasingly that we do have changes when white people still do not want to consult with the accepted leaders of black people and have to consult with people whose leadership came up through the white established institutions. Effectively, Koboza was calling us not to celebrate changes prematurely and to recognize the persistence of the injustices around us. And though much has changed since 1977, and those statutes and laws have tumbled, many of the forms of oppression which they were designed to institute have lingered. And so we might add, it is no use to tell us that we have the vote or the franchise when all around us we see destitution, racialized poverty, gender inequality, and various legacies of apartheid. And until we are aggressive in tackling those injustices, those injustices will continue to aggressively wreak havoc on the dreams and hopes which were built through the minds, voices, and thoughts of the brave journalists who suffered oppression on this day 44 years ago and who stood up uh, for justice despite great and grave threats. How do we remember their names? How do we remember their sacrifices? By being aggressive in tackling injustice because injustice is aggressive in its oppression. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed, um, Dr. Mbofu Walsh, for that thought-provoking lecture. You've given us a lot to chew on, and we certainly and most definitely appreciate uh, you making the time and delivering this year's lecture. Um, this is definitely befitting of uh, the stature that uh, Pesi Boza and the many other journalists of his time um, stood for. Um, as I was introducing our uh, respondents, um, who form part of our panel for this year. I had already introduced Dr. Mandla, uh, uh, bigger pardon, Professor Mandla Khatebe. And next, I would like to introduce Mr. Lorato Tengeng, who is the founder and chief executive of Decode Communications. Um, Mr. Tengeng is a reputation management and crisis communication specialist with keen interest in technology. He is a media contributor and freelance columnist writing for publications, including the City Press. And uh, last but not least, in our panel, we also have uh, Mepati Swamagopeni, who is uh, the SABC Head of News and uh, Current Affairs. She has a Master's of Philosophy in Education and an MBA, and currently she is a candidate for Doctor in Business Administration. Good morning once again to all our viewers, our friends and partners who are following the lecture. Remember to follow the proceedings on our social media platforms by following UNISA or the National Press Club uh, accounts on Twitter. Um, first, let me start with you, Professor Khadebe, and give you the opportunity to respond um, to the lecture. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Program di Director, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh, uh, know that I gave you a standing ovation for that very, very erudite and thought-provoking submission, uh, which befits uh, the occasion that we are all gathered here for. Quite a few of observations I, I, I would like to make based on your remark. I think the first one that I wanted I want to underline up front 
is that, uh, and this is coming uh, coming from your 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 submission, uh, is that um, capitalism is uh, the locomotive that prop propels the reproduction of colonialism uh, of the spatial type, um, uh, apartheid, if you like it. I think that's very important for me. Uh, in my view, it is the engine upon which all forms of uh, oppression and discrimination are founded and constantly rewarded. Uh, and I think you, your, your last point on the the migration of the problem to digital platforms and therefore re, which re-entrenches uh, uh, the hither to existing problems, I thought it was also uh, quite profound in my uh, in my observation. But let me make uh, uh, quickly, uh, in the interest of time, program director, two theses that I think are important in relation to the discussions today. The first one, um, as uh, enunciated by Dr. Mpofu Walsh, is the fundamental question of the thoroughgoing transformation agenda uh, in the media. Uh, and if we are to really honor the pioneering generation of uh, Pesit Koboza, we have to address this, the, uh, this question. The second thesis I would like to make, and which is linked to the first one, uh, pertains to the how part. And I think I would want to put on the table the question of the decommodification of the mediated public sphere. So that, those are the two points, uh, Program Director, I would like to make. Let me just quickly um, uh, raise these few points around transformation, which I thought uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh uh, dealt with quite adequately. And in my view, any attempt that seeks to analyze the contemporary South African media uh, will indeed be incomplete uh, without the, uh, unraveling the often an, a misunderstood question of transformation. And I think we must thank you, Dr. Walsh, for, for presenting uh, us with the, the, the hard facts uh, that we must deal with. But I think, uh, Program Director, is that in our context, um, uh, and again, this is a point that Dr. Um, Bofu Walsh deal, uh, dealt with, is that is, 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 is the rationale behind transformation, which seeks to address the racial imbalances as a result of uh, colonialism and apartheid legacies, uh, which was entrenched uh, by white minority control of the economic base and therefore extended to uh, superstructure features such as the media and others, so, uh, and others uh, in, in the society as, uh, as a whole. Therefore, this, the systemic racial exclusion of the African people in all forms of economic activities, uh, activities is therefore the basis upon which we need to uh, understand the, the question of transformation. And I think that this point uh, that Dr. Mbofu was raises for me is what I think we must all take out uh, from this session and begin to deal with these issues uh, uh, and deal with the source. But in my view, as I conclude, uh, Program Director, on this point, and then I will conclude quickly, briefly on, on, on the last one, is, is that um, uh, there are varying degrees um, uh, and, and, and I think the question of transformation manifests itself in varying degrees in the, in, in, in the, media, in the media sector in particular. One of the problems that we must deal with is the, fun, the fundamental question of the concentrated ownership and therefore the lack of diversity, as, I, as again articulated very well uh, by Dr. Mbofu Walsh, which then manifests itself in the question of ownership and control. The inclusion of race, language, gender and content is a very important a big point uh, that we must address. The 14% black ownership, is, in my view, uh, if you look at, a, at the, across the value chain of the media, is a question that we need to address. And lastly, uh, Program Director, is the, the, the point uh, I think that is important we need to think about is that when we talk about the how part, is what I think we must uh, really deal with is a, the decommodification uh, and create creation of an alternative media space because my my view and my argument 
is that the commercialized dominated media is fundamentally unable to transform uh, precisely because of its location in the capitalist structure of production. And therefore, we need to think of this alternative that will, that will essentially uh, ensure that it, is, uh, it, it has a public character, it is accessible to all, it can play a vital role in advancing the general education of the subalternized working class uh, people in, uh, in this country. It, 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 and therefore, the decommodified media, in my view, uh, must emphasize the use value over and above the other values that are imbued in the capitalist system, be it the exchange value, the surplus value, and all other, other values. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Program Director. But I think, uh, as I said, Dr. Bovo Walsh, I, give you, I gave you a standing ovation because it is truly deserved. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khadebe, for, for that. And um, um, for those who might not know, Professor Khadebe is from the University of uh, Johannesburg uh, in their strategic communication department, but also he authored a book uh, just over a year ago uh, titled Constructing Hegemony, the South African Commercial Media and the Misre Misrepresentation rather, of Nationalism. Um, at this point in time as well, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Tengeng, Mr. Lorato Tengeng, as I have mentioned earlier. He is the founder and the chief executive of Decode Communication. Good morning, Mr. Tengeng. Good morning, Musidi. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, good morning to Dr. Uh, Sizwem of Welsh and my fellow panelists. Good morning to everyone who's uh, tuning in uh, virtually. And uh, it's quite an honor to be here. Uh, and and uh, in, in, in the same uh, appreciation of uh, Professor Khadebe, uh, Dr. Mbofu, Welsh, uh, I, I'm also giving a standing ovation for, for really pricking uh, our consciences, particularly, you know, appropriately uh, using some of the quotes uh, and, and, and that are attributed to uh, Dr. Pesi Proboza. And uh, as, as, as you, you, you were drawing to a close, I, I was hearing you, uh, you know, almost asking this question that uh, often is asked but I, I suspect we don't uh, sit down enough to interrogate what the answer is, right? Who guards the guardians, right? As you're talking about the, you know, the, the almost lack of regulation of these, uh, the, 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 the technologies and, and, and the, the, the digital platforms that utilizes, uh, you, you know, certain uh, sequences and series, series, uh, multiple series, that guide or at least, uh, you know, move the communities in terms of indicating who should uh, associate with whom and, and, and the likes. And I think that's a question that as we, we, we are interrogating the topic today, how, you know, the, the role of the media in the, in the digital age and how far it will go in serving the voice of the dispossessed and, and uh, channeling change for and, and real democracy. That, that, that's the, 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 for me, the biggest question we should uh, make time uh, to answer. But uh, so, so my, my, my submission, uh, uh, Dr. Mbof Welsh, uh, with the, you know, related to what, what you raised, but also the two key things that I wanted to place on the table was really to say, uh, or, or is really to say, one, the, the, role of the media is not questionable in society right uh, it's you know it, it's positioning and and, and uh, what it, it ought to serve it is not questionable right the biggest thing now is that with uh, the you, you know moving with digital uh, almost moving as fast as it is the perhaps the question that we should then ask is what is the great promise that this digital revolution is, uh, you know, at least uh, we should be thinking about, uh, particularly as it pertains to journalism, right? I remember as far back as 2007 when I was there, uh, when I had the opportunity to work with the uh, SABC board, I was the sports spokesperson at the time, and, and uh, the, the, the theme of the corporate strategy 
was uh, total citizen empowerment, right? And and in there there were a number of a number of uh, uh, key phrases and key words that were being used: uh, multiplicity of voices, uh, you know, pluralism of of voices. And and I want to add the third one, which really is around democratization, right? So in my view, what the digital revolution uh, ought to to have done, or at least uh, ought to be doing, is democratizing, uh, which then quickens this, uh, you, you know, issues that the SABC and many other media platforms or anyone who's concerned about the role of the media in any thriving, uh, in any thriving democracy ought to be preoccupied with, right, to say, so, so when you, you, you consider that with digital and, and people are able to you know, mobilize, organize themselves. Uh, they, they are not really limited to using or at least a, a brick and mortar for them to establish a establish a, a media house, right? And fortunately, we have a number of examples that have at least guided or at least shown us that it is possible. And, and particularly, that really talks to the marginalized, which is what the what what, what the topic today uh, uh, is driving us towards, right? The example uh, is Daily Vox, right? Remember, uh, during the Fismas, at the height of the Fismas fall uh, back in 2015, uh, there, there, there was, a, a, you, you know, discontent from the students who were raising the issue around mainstream media and how they were covering the student protests, right? They were, they, they, there was this voice that they felt that was missing in the sense of uh, you know, where, where, whenever the stories would be covered around the student protest, a, a lot of us at home uh, in our spaces we were seeing anarchy, uh, we were seeing destruction of property, we were just seeing unruly students. And they thought that to, to set up and to, to uh, Professor uh, Hadebe's uh, point around the alternative, they really set, set out to set up this alternative narrative or alternative platform, which was Daily Vox, Fortunately, and I say fortunately because I think that we should jealously guard, uh, you, you know, this noble profession of journalism where we know that, that, that there are principles, there are certain standards, and there's a framework within which to work in, in, in ensuring that uh, the, the information that comes out on the other end facing the public ought to be trustworthy or ought to be trusted and, and, and ought to be credible. And, and the example of the Daily Vox shows that. But to the question that uh, Professor Mandla uh, Hadebe raises is then around, it is set up, but what about the sustainability, right? And, and perhaps that's the, the other thing that as we are thinking about the importance of digital and how it has quickened to help those who feel marginalized, as the students at the time felt marginalized, they were able to set up quickly, you know, there were students within the journalism fraternity, but they were able to re report from the point of view of the student and a lot of us trusted the news that came out of there because there was a system of some sort that that, that, that was working. The second example that I'd, li I'd really like to use is the Ushahidi uh, social activism platform, right? So we remember the, the disputed uh, Kenyan uh, elections uh, in, 2000 and in 2007 between uh, uh, Raila Odinga, the presidential election, Raila Odinga and, and Mwai Kibaki, which, uh, you know, ended up with uh, ethnic violence, or at least what was called ethnic violence, right? Uh, or characterized rather. Uh, Ushahidi uh, is, is, a, is a, a social activism platform which enabled, uh, or, or at least uh, quickened and, and catalyzed citizen journalism. We had always had and, 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 and you know, read a lot about and understood citizen journalism, but, but Ushahidi, you know, by way of uh, ordinary citizens, as they observe uh, violence within their localities, they were able to use, you know, ordinary phones so that they can then send it to a, to a central platform and be able to, to, sh to share. Uh, and and so, so then there was a depiction or a visualization of how widespread the problem is because ordinarily the state, uh, or at least at the time, the state media uh, uh, operatives, they, they were trying to downplay the problem. So, so what I'm raising here is that 
the the advantage of digital or at least what is what we've been given by the advantage of digital is that there's always an opportunity for those who are marginalized in ensuring that they reap the benefits of a democracy right but for me and i guess in in, in closing the, 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 this my, my contribution is we must then guard jealously because we know that unless there is enough money to sustain those platforms even that money uh, you know sometimes can be uh, it can can come with uh, certain agendas we must guard jealously these platforms that provide the alternative narrative advances uh, you know the agenda and the pride of those who are marginalized and ensuring that we are then able to to, to sustain them a uh, 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 program director i'd like to uh, uh, break it here and we can continue with the comments as we continue Thank you, Mr. Tsengeng, for, for your uh, great input. And uh, last on our panel is uh, none other than Mepati Magopeni from uh, the SABC. Good morning and over to you, ma'am. Good morning, colleagues, and good morning. Um, uh, thank you, Program Director, and the esteemed um, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Siswe Mbof Walsh, um, and my um, esteemed panelists, as well as the audience um, that is watching um, virtually. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and um, I'm, I'm quite honored um, to be invited to make some contribution to a very important discussion that we really need to have is the media. Um, I'm, I'm just triggered by the quote that um, the keynote speaker uh, used uh, coming from Pisikoboza about us being aggressive in dealing with racial discrimination, which was at the time and that actually now we also need to be looking at socioeconomic, uh, cultural discrimination and inequalities that are, that are persistent uh, in, in, in our society. Um, back to the question um, that follows the statement on the role of the media in the digital age, as in how far will it go in servicing the voice of the dispossessed as a channel for change and real democracy. And just the first part about the how far, um, I, I, it, it makes me think about the fact that it assumes that um, we are actually committed to serving the voice of the dispossessed and 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 effecting change and real and, and uh, enhancing real democracy. And it also assumes that the purpose and the primary pursuit of the media remains the same. And we then need to ask ourselves: How robust is that assumption? Is that still the case? And if you look at the fact that um, the purpose and pursuit of the media, uh, particularly news media, is centered on promoting um, democratic principles, which are transparency, accountability, and the freedom of speech, um, is that still the case? And if you look at how the news media is scrambling for survival, are the interests of the dispossessed even a consideration? And the issue of sustainability of the news media um, is directly linked to its ability to serve as a channel for change and strengthen democracy. And the point that Lorado has just made about uh, sustainability of these platforms. And in my case, I don't even want to uh, confine myself to the digital platforms and other emerging platforms that are serving um, the purpose of disseminating information and news. Um, I can still go back and think about how even the traditional media being radio, television, and, and as we know them, that it, it, it's still not, it hasn't gone far enough to address the news and information needs of the dispossessed. Even traditional media is not doing so. So the question of universal accessibility of the media remains a matter of the haves and the have-nots, even to this day. And while there is excitement around the ability of digital platforms to democratize information, the reality is that the cost of doing so 
remains prohibitive for the majority and the dispossessed. And that is our reality. And in that attempt to address the issues of sustainability, um, which is what the private media is doing now, um, that there's a construction of paywalls, that you see content that's put behind paywalls, which is not something that the public broadcaster would do because we still have to ensure that there's universal access to the information and news that the public broadcaster um, distributes. But in the case of the private media, uh, what it means is that you're still creating um, pockets of information that's only available to certain parts of the citizenry. And here's another thing. As you do so, what it means is that there's a penalty that, that the dispossessed have to suffer, which, which is a poverty penalty of a different kind. And in the process, we're also creating information asymmetries. If you look at just what is going on now that we are going to elections, um, so we would have communities that don't have access to the, it's something that I call news on tech, which is predominantly English. Bio news channels that are 24 hours, 24 operations and via digital platforms that are that are that are everywhere and anytime for English consuming or English news consuming audiences. Is it the case for African languages? And why is it not the case? And how is it that the focus remains on a small audience being the English audiences that consume news content? And how is it that all the resources that we have are disproportionately allocated to serving English audiences? And the, 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 the notion that um, where you talk about profit motives, the notion that um, audiences that consume African languages are not bankable as in commercializable is actually not true. And it's been proven elsewhere that actually your best performing stations within the SAPC stable would be your African languages. So how is it that we still view these audiences as not bankable and therefore remain underserved. And this is a problem that we need to address. So it cannot be that on, a, on any day you are sitting with audiences that would get their news content after every 24 hour cycle at 7 p.m. This is the only time that you're going to have your bulletins delivered in African languages. These are things that we, we need to pay attention to. And, and, and the other part is while we know that in supporting or promoting democratic principles, the media has a responsibility to promote human rights observance by making people aware of their rights and responsibilities and expose violations and injustices. How far are we still committed to that? If you look at the profit, mo profit motive, and I'm going to extend this to even the public broadcaster because it's not only, it's not only something that's, that, that's applicable to the private media, as we know the public broadcaster and how it is funded, as we know it and, and, and how it is funded, the reality is we have a public broadcaster as a principle. It remains an ideal, it remains an aspiration, but the reality is it, com it, it basically operates on commercial principles because you look at the 97% of the revenue that it generates, all that comes from either advertising, sponsorship and TV license collection. The rest that comes from funding that's allocated um, by, by the state is sitting at around 2%, which is even less than half of the salaries of the news division. I'm just making an example in this case, but it is so. So when you look at that, you, you don't only think of how we aim to impact the dispossessed and change, um, or effect change and, and, and contribute to real democracy. You also have to think about how the reliance on market forces is actually a threat to the work that the public broadcaster has to do because in that case, you could end up designing your content to meet the requirements of the market such that you generate the revenue you require. And, and this is where the danger is. So what is supposedly a public mandate that the SAPC has to carry relies heavily on market forces and there is a lot that would happen in that space if we are not paying attention because the purpose is going to be channeled towards generating revenue instead of serving the public. And, and, and the last part for me um, in, in this area is that we, we, we talk about media freedom, we talk about freedom of expression, and we talk about advancements um, in technology and the 
digital majority, digital maturity of, of the media landscape and, and, and the country itself. But without addressing why we need all of those and look at inclusion, which is considering all the voices in the peripheral of society, and not only just the voices, but a full consideration of their lived experiences. And the other part that also talks to media freedom and freedom of expression is intellectual independence. We know we may not be Pesikabu we may not be living in that era, we may have all the, the openness, the open, openness that we require as the media to operate. But the reality is the intellectual independence of the media is still required to the extent that people should be able to push back against censorship and the muzzling of voices that are considered critical um, of whatever is happening in the country. Because the, it is necessary that we, that we promote diversity of thought as the media to ensure the plurality that Lorado was talking about and ensuring that um, the national, national discourse remains robust as a result of the plurality of the voices that, are, that, that, that we see in the media. But on the role of the media um, in, in, in all societies and in all democracies, we know that all power needs witnesses. But when you talk about that, you have to ask yourself, is, is the media, is it sufficient to remain passive observers and just delivering the he says, she says kind of journalism? Or are we going to take it a step further and interrogate the issues that come out of that he says, she says? And are we comfortable delivering plain vanilla journalism that asks no questions? Uh, is, it, is it necessary for us to push the boundaries and say, we are going to be active witnesses to what is happening and be the watchdog and whistleblowers that prioritize the interests of the citizens, which is the transformative purpose of the media? Are we ready to do that? And how is it that we think we need to, de to depend on digital technologies to do so? Because if we're going to talk about inclusion, we're going to talk about intellectual independence and diversity of thought, it's all about intentionality. And intentionality is a mindset issue. It's got nothing to do with platforms and it's got nothing to do with technologies. Those are channels that you use to access your audiences. So if we don't introspect, as uh, Dr. Mbof Walsh has suggested, um, and in the context of an unapologetic aggression to address injustices, we will all bear the collective shame of irresponsibility for making habitual decisions that sustain the status quo and produce a future that no one wants. And that would be tragic in the context of the work of Pesu Kaboza. And I'm going to leave it here. Thank you. Mr. Jones, please unmute. Jones is still unmuted, if I can be heard. You can proceed. Mr. Charlie, you are muted. Seemingly, when you start speaking, you get muted automatically. I'm not sure why. Yeah, fine, you can speak.
hanging. That is the problem. It is hanging. Sorry about that. Trying to say thank you to all our panelists and, of course, um, Dr. Ogwan for presenting such an eloquent and thought provoking lecture and the response by the panelists of uh, Hadebe. Thank you very much. Can we now swiftly move on to an answer session? Perhaps the comments that may have come through and it's my and back to you, uh, uh, Musi. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Charlie. Um, Dr. Mpofu Walsh, I have a comment um, directed to you. Um, and it's from Zolani, and it says, what makes the private, privatized or the hashtag, the new apartheid so dangerous is that its perpetrators um, continue to brainwash people to support their injustice and ill deeds with smiles. Their oppression continues to be aggressive in denying citizens their constitutional rights while squandering community wealth. And the first question is from Anonymous, and it says, Hi, Dr. Mpofu Walsh. Um, do you happen to have read Weapons of Mad uh, Destruction by Kathy O'Neill? I'm not sure if you would like to perhaps uh, just weigh in on the comment, but also uh, respond to the first question that we have. Uh, before I let you speak, actually, let me also uh, just reiterate that uh, all our viewers who are uh, uh, following this uh, lecture can actually pose their questions or comments uh, on the chat box and we'll take in as many as we possibly can uh, during the session. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, let me just start by uh, once again, thanking uh, Prof. Khadebe, um, Mr. Chenkeng and Ms. Magobeni for thought-provoking and fruitful uh, responses and uh, a very generative discussion. Um, I'm mindful that you're all senior to me, uh, so it's a great honor to have you uh, reflecting on, on my thoughts and provocations, and thank you very much for for doing so, and uh, I know as the discussion unfolds, uh, unfolds, I'll be able to uh, take up and uh, explore some of your important interventions. Um, but thank you very much for all of them. Um, to Zolani, um, I agree with the the statement. You probably won't be surprised uh, to hear. But I would also just like to respond to the comment by linking it briefly to something that uh, Ms. Magopeni raised, which is, and in fact, all the, all the respondents, but this tension between <clears throat> market imperatives on the one hand and social imperatives on the other hand. And I think what happened in the transition to democracy, um, and this is key to understanding the idea of the new apartheid, is that uh, I argue that apartheid uh, became policed by price rather than prose. So where there was once a discriminatory law, we have now replaced that with a financial barrier. And despite some exceptions, the financial barriers actually create the same constraints in many ways, even if they've been slightly diluted than the racial laws. And this, I think, has been explored uh, eloquently in the way that market uh, priorities can subvert uh, editorial agendas. But I think it's a wider problem in our society of the way that we keep people out of the spaces, uh, as I said, that matters. The way we do it now is through a financial logic rather than a legal logic. But in many ways, they have acted and act in the same direction. Um, in terms of the anonymous question, we Weapons of Math Destruction uh, is a great book. I have read it. In fact, I did explore it in my book. Uh, so it's, it's a play on weapons of mass destruction, and it's, it calls algorithms weapons of math destruction because of the way that computational and digital uh, algorithms have increasingly started to uh, pattern 
oppression. And I would also add there's another uh, pun by uh, Professor Cornell West, where he calls digital media weapons of mass distraction. So I think we can call algorithms weapons of math destruction and weapons of mass distraction that uh, are increasingly mechanizing the human and humanizing machines. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh, for that uh, input. I do have uh, just a few uh, questions which I would like uh, even our panelists as well to just weigh in on them. The first question being that uh, uh, with the rise of uh, citizen journalism, um, is the ideology of uh, journalism being used as a channel of change still possible, more so that uh, um, this new phenomena raises concerns around uh, the credibility of the news generated through um, uh, citizen uh, journalism, but also how is regulation even possible, seeing that uh, any person can break news on social media platforms uh, as we embrace uh, the new era of the digital age. And I would welcome any um, panelist or even our um, speaker, Dr. Walsh as well, Mbufu Walsh rather, to also weigh in on uh, those two questions. Could I perhaps uh, ask uh, Professor Khadeve to uh, lead us on that? Because I think you touch on that as well in your book. Uh, I hope uh, I'm audible. The I think I think the, the the platform that carries the news uh, is very important in dealing with the content and all other features um, of uh, journalism. Journalism does not happen in a vacuum; it happens in a particular context, and that is why I emphasize the structural factors. Uh, of uh, the media uh, of particular important uh, in us understanding um, the the political economy of that uh, uh, of that perspective. So, for example, um, if we if we scrutinize the commercialized media, and I think that uh, Patti so I was speaking about it, the 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 challenges of commercialization. Uh, because it cuts across. Um, SABC, for example, is a public is a public broadcaster by name, uh, but it is in essence it is uh, by and large a commercialized uh, entity that uh, is informed by the capitalist logic in in its production processes, uh, and therefore that content uh, perpetuates the reproduction. Uh, uh, of colonialist colonialist I, uh, ideas uh, across society. So the platform becomes important and therefore the platform with, within which uh, uh, citizen journalism, uh, which is the, the, the mediated platform, such as the ones that we are using, is as important as uh, the commercialized uh, platform. So uh, of course it got it, uh, citizen journalism has got many challenges in my view uh, because it is through these platforms that misinformation and disinformation is perpetuated. If you look at it, the plethora of um, infodemics uh, around COVID-19, for example, it's precisely because of that freedom of expression that has been abused. Um, in as much as I am critical uh, of commercialized media uh, platforms, but I'm of the view that the, they are still the safest in, in a sense that they give us um, a regulated space where we know that the facts that we get from those platforms uh, in all likelihood have been checked. Um, so without uh, any form of regulation, it is it, it becomes quite a challenge really to to entertain any thoughts 
uh, of citizen journalism, unless that 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 that, that journalism uh, is sort of channeled in a particular way, uh, that we know that the facts they forget. There's a verification uh, uh, a process thereof. So that is why, in my view, in in beginning to toy with the idea of decommodification, it's precisely that we need to. How do we then marry the two? Um, with a view that it becomes fundamentally a public service that uh, is not uh, driven by any values. Yeah, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, uh, Prof. Khatebe. Um, Mr. Tsungeng, I'm uh, thinking rather, I know you have um, uh, written very boldly uh, recently uh, in a number of publications uh, to that effect. Do you perhaps want to uh, weigh in as well? Thank you so much, uh, Musidi. So one of the, the observations I've made is that uh, I doubt any, you know, ordinary citizens, every ordinary citizen wake up and say, I am a, 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 a you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm a, a journalist or I'm a citizen journalist, right? People tell the stories from an eyewitness account, right? And I guess then, then the, 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 the capturing of that because they feed into, uh, you know, the, the news gathering, they feed into the news media because the, then, uh, the, 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 you know, eyewitness account is taken into and then there's a process of filtering, uh, verification and all of that, right? right? So, so, so in, in my view, the first thing is to acknowledge that uh, uh, citizens don't want to be journalists, right? But citizens will always rise or raise their hands whenever they see that there may be some bias of some sort. And, and, and I've observed, even when you listen to uh, talk radio stations, right, uh, often uh, talk radio hosts are called out by the callers to say, but I think that you are biased or on this topic or the other, and I could, you know, I, I could tell the way you are facilitating conversation X, Y, or Z, or how you are moderating on an issue. Right. So, so th th there's always th this rise of accountability. Right. Perhaps the, the most important uh, uh, thing around citizen journalism is how much do we stop and uh, do pulse check on when you hear a number of people raising a voice on an issue to say, yeah, but you're, you're not speaking enough on issue X, Y, or Z. How much does a you know an SABC, for instance, stop and say, is there merit in what they are raising? Does a you know a other private media institution do the same? I don't see much of that happening, and perhaps this is where we then need the the intersection of uh, the academics to come in and say and and help us and say. You know, they, they, they come, they're not necessarily coming from a neutral point of view, but at least they're coming from a data collection and data collation point of view and present, a, you know, a, a research report of some sort where we are going to be able to reflect because it's, it's possible that sometimes even this uh, agitation really comes out of, I may have missed the reportage or I may have missed uh, you, you, you know, the, the, the story that may have been reported and therefore I feel that they, they may have been under-reporting. So, 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 so perhaps th th that's where we then need to, you know, elevate or at least, you, you know, find a way of how do we find collaboration between the, the media as it were uh, and the, the academic institutions such that there is a way of making sure that uh, one, we pulse check on whether the you, you know uh, uh, whether when people raise uh, censorship of of uh, certain voices or, or or even shutting down of certain voices there is uh, there, there, there is truth to to that but but, but the, the 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 last part which i wanted to to contribute to uh, uh, musidi is the issue around uh, the lack of or, or not really the lack of right the, the the missing element of dialogue, right? So so I remember there, there was a time when News 24 uh, used to have comments on their opinion pieces, right? And of course, because of the toxicity that came with, with that, there were a lot of people who were hiding behind the keyboards 
and they would, you, you know, either, uh, you, you know, flood uh, the, the people who would have written the opinion pieces or even fight amongst themselves. And, and, and you could see that it was a very bad environment. And what News24 decided to do was to shut that platform, right? The question is, in the absence of that platform to uh, encourage debate, encourage engagement, encourage, you, you know, a, a, a robust, uh, you know, critiquing of peop people's opinions, do we uh, then just shut it, shut it down because we are worried that it's, create, it's generating toxicity? Or do we find an alternative way of ensuring that these, uh, th 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 these debates continue? Because I think that the, 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 that that is missing, it means that we are not always going to be able to have platforms for uh, generating ideas, uh, debating ideas, and even thinking about the consciousness that we ought to be raising in society. Thank you, Musidi. Thank you, Lorato, for uh, your input. Before I let uh, Dr. Mpufu Walsh also weigh in and possibly uh, Mepa Tiswa. Um, I, I actually uh, remembered uh, as a comment or rather a quote that uh, uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh used in, in his uh, address. Um, and I think you quoted Ugogo Machikli in it to say a democratic majority can become the democratic minority. And Lerado, you've just mentioned now the missing element of, of, of dialogue, you know. Um, and earlier on as well, uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh, you mentioned the use of euphemism. And uh, it actually brings me to a point uh, that has been raised as a comment as well to say, looking at how the media is reporting um, on, on, on the issue of vaccination in particular, those who are asking questions uh, are being seen as anti-vexers when in fact tying into a topic of uh, media being and serving as the voice of the dispossessed and as a channel of change and real democracy, where does one draw the line? Um, are we now over the days of uh, dialogue where um, media could also be engaged on what they are reporting on? Because I think uh, the sentiment even on social media is that anybody who dare to ask or raise uh, concerns around uh, the, the, the va vaccines and the vaccination process is then seen as an anti-vaxxer. Uh, could I perhaps ask you to just uh, weigh in on that comment as well? Sorry, just taking a while to unmute here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, my goodness, as if I hadn't uh, been controversial enough, you now want me to weigh into the, the vaccine debate. Um, look, uh, before, I, before I get to that, um, just, just to say on, on the general point of euphemism, um, it seems to me that we need to go back to the, the basic question of trying our hardest to tell the truth as we see it uh, and being unafraid of characterizing how bad things really are in, in, in our country. Uh, and, and sure, there are wonderful and, and beautiful things too, and we should characterize them as such. But it seems to me that the general crisis um, is that we keep characterizing in beautiful terms what everyone can see is, is in fact uh, a crisis. And we need to go back to, to just telling the truth about the crisis. And this is why I think raising the word apartheid um, as serious and as solemn as that word is and, and how much it means to everyone uh, who has been afflicted and affected by apartheid. But, but reintroducing that term, I think, shows the gravity of, of what it is that we have to deal with. And, and if, we, if we continue to use neutral terms, 
uh, to, to depict the social and economic crises and political crises that we face, then we're doing a disservice to the truth, ultimately. Um, and so what this means is that we do have to pursue an agenda uh, to take up uh, Mayor Patiswa Makopeni's uh, challenge to us. Because the trap is that if we start uh, assuming that our role as journalists or, or, in, or public people in the public intellectual space is to is to present abstract neutral notions then under the guise of neutrality we entrench inequality and we we normalize and we naturalize the crisis and so we do have to chart a very deliberate and unapologetic and nobly aggressive agenda an alternative to the injustice and i think that agenda has to be centered on questions of, of racial justice uh, it's not just a question of, of freedom of speech or, or transparency. It's a question of justice. It's a question of gender justice too, uh, and many other forms of, of apartheid oppression and how we uproot those. And I think we should just say that's what we're about and that's what we're going uh, to do and, and proceed from that starting point. Um, having said that, on the question of vaccination, well, I think uh, being loyal to the truth and justice doesn't mean that we lose complexity. And I think many of the key questions that the media can tackle don't revolve around solving questions, they revolve around framing questions. Um, in the words of uh, Professor Cohen, a political scientist, the media can't tell people what to think, but it can tell people what to think about. And I think all too often we frame debates with, with great simplicity, and the way we think debate happens is by just bringing two extreme positions uh, to the table and letting them hammer out those extreme positions, when in actual fact, the far more nuanced questions that lie in the center of those debates are, are thereby uh, missed. And so for me, on the one hand, I think the science of vaccination is absolutely clear, that vaccination dramatically reduces the chance of contracting COVID and spreading COVID and of dying from COVID. And uh, the preservation of life is of such an important, uh, there's no justice if there's no life after all. So I I'm afraid having looked at the scientific data, I have to, uh, I have to be persuaded by, by the mountain of evidence for vaccination. But that doesn't mean that we can't also have a conversation about how uh, major multinational corporations are also complicit in various other forms of exploitation. And so it's a complicated picture uh, to the extent that we often rely on big unaccountable power, uh, but sometimes we need to do that because it saves our lives. And how do we have that complex conversation where we appreciate the importance of vaccination uh, in saving and preserving life, but also we complicate power relations uh, and the global power relations which have created great vaccine inequalities. So that's the, that's the best way I can resolve that, uh, that difficult and controversial question. Uh, Mayor Magopeni, perhaps you can help us. I know you come from a, a, a space where you have uh, uh, the advantage of uh, the various languages and platforms that the SABC provides um, in helping ordinary citizens to probably understand better uh, and buy into the vaccination process uh, and the vaccines uh, themselves. Um, could I perhaps ask you as well to just weigh in on that particular question and comment? Um, thank you, Ms. Edi. Um, the, the point here, in the work that we do, um, our responsibility is to provide credible information around the vaccines. 
whatever information is out there that's verifiable and that's proven to be scientifically um, um, acceptable. So that's that, that's our responsibility as 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 as, as news uh, producers or as journalists. But it is not our responsibility to persuade people to take vaccines. That responsibility lies elsewhere. And when that happens, coming from whoever has to do that, we will cover the stories. But our responsibility is to provide information to the extent that the citizens are able to make informed choices regarding what they want to do with their lives. And I actually... um, I'm reminded of an incident when we covered um, a protest um, in Cape Town, an anti anti vaccine protest in Cape Town, and the um, attacks that we had to deal with, as in, why are you giving these people a platform? And similarly to one of the political parties that has taken the vaccination issue as its electioneering um, uh, uh, tool that we had to carry that live and interview the leader of the party. Um, And the questions that arose again as to why are you giving this anti-vaxxer, as as, as it said, anti-vaxxer a platform um, to to perpetuate their views. And this is what we are supposed to do as journalists, is to provide an open space for people to air their views, including dissenting voices. It is not for us to silence voices that are found to be creating discomfort elsewhere. Um, so if you find those voices uncomfortable, deal with them on your own. It is not our responsibility to silence people because there's a view that whatever views they are perpetrating is not in the interest of, um, in this case, um, getting the nation fully vaccinated, as, as, as it's being said. So ours is to provide credible information to the extent that citizens make informed choices and we leave citizens to make those choices. As it was just said, we are not, it's not our responsibility to get to, to tell citizens how to think. They know how to think for as long as the information is provided to them there. And we do this in all the languages um, that we broadcast in. But the second point is, Back to the issue of um, citizen journalism, I want just to make a, com- a comment there. And I do think that it's a framing issue that we even call it citizen journalism. When Lorato framed it correctly as in saying, these are people who are eyewitnesses to incident and they decide to report on them or write about them on social media platforms. So it is up to the media houses and the journalists who are in those spaces um, to pick up on that information do rigorous checks and exercise editorial controls um, in, in, in dealing with that information that it becomes part of mainstream mainstream news coverage. So the responsibility of institutional journalists is, is, is key in this case because people are still looking for branded content despite the fact that they still listen to the eyewitnesses that are posting all this information on social media. So the checks still have, they still have to be done. So both what we call citizen journalism and institutional journalism, they have a space and they can coexist. And actually it is to the benefit of citizens that they both coexist. And in the last part that I I often wonder every time I see the use of the word media, that we tend to leave the other side, which actually has a greater influence on how um, society conducts itself, which is the infotainment side of the media. And what has happened in that space, from my observation, over the years, we have seen the, 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 the importation of Western scripts, whether it's your soapies, your dramas, and whatever else, they come and then they get adapt, adapted to, local, to the local environment without the essence of those scripts being changed to suit the current environment. And we end up reproducing cultures that are not necessarily um, working for the South African society. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure it's the case with other African continent, with, 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 with our sister countries on the continent. So we import the values from other societies and those societies are actually far advanced 
than where South Africa is. We still have a democracy that's developing. We still have a responsibility for nation building. We still have a responsibility for social cohesion. But what we import is not necessarily helpful to our situation. But there is not much attention that's being paid to that side of the media. The focus is still on journalism and what it does in shaping democracy. But there's the other element which is very critical in shaping the social fabric. Uh, and um, you look at this um, and you watch these this, this production, these entertainment um, programs, and you ask yourself, if I have a, a teenager who has to watch this program, there's nothing that says um, this is fiction and this is just for entertainment purposes. And therefore, it doesn't mean that it is something factual that you can really make your decisions around as a youngster. Um, so there isn't that explanation as they watch the content. And it does not really assist the society to do what it needs to do, such that we produce a stable and sustainable de democracy, even that side of entertainment. And I do think that there's more, um, more, more, more attention that needs to be paid to that side of the media. There is enough that's being said about journalism. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Patiswa Magopeni. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, our panelists to just uh, quickly give their closing remarks before we move to uh, the next item on the agenda. But in doing so, I'd like to also ask you to perhaps uh, just weigh in on the missing voice of community media um, in, in aligning to our topic or our theme of this year's lecture. Um, may I perhaps start with you, uh, Professor Khadebe? CD, thank you very much. I was getting agitated and frustrated by the noise that is happening here next door. So I hope you it's, it's not as audible as it's happening uh, on my side. I think um, two two points in conclusion. Uh, I think a party is raising a very fundamental point in framing the media in this broad uh, sense in articulating some of the problems that uh, we're faced uh, with, certainly. Uh, community media in the context um, of the debate that we're already having here of citizen journalism, in my view, is that in the, uh, in the absence of a progressive alternative media that speaks to the citizens and the community as they are, uh, certainly they are going to find alternatives that they are going to do them themselves, whether then we call it citizen journalism, uh, community media, and whatever, whatever you it is going to rise organically, certainly because of the, the structures that uh, limits the subalterns um, where they are. And that for me is an important and one of the biggest uh, uh, problems that we find ourselves uh, uh, faced with is that the we have a public broadcaster, as I've already said, that uh, is only a public broadcaster in name. Uh, if you look at the unsatisfactory use of indigenous language in the SAPC, for example, uh, I would argue that the, it is precisely what it, that, that leads and perpetuates the retention of the colonial and apartheid era um, uh, language status quo and all other uh, problems that we faced with. So at the heart of everything that we have discussed today, that Dr. Walsh and both put on the table, I think that's what you must uh, uh, contend with, is a thoroughgoing transformation um, of the media. But my view, my argument, is that that transformation uh, of a uh, superstructure cannot happen uh, in the absence of the transformation of the economic base, because it is the economic base that gives a rise to all um, are the manifestations of the problems that we have in this country. Racism, for example, uh, it can only be sustained um, by the arrogant racists precisely because they've got an economic control of all facets uh, of, of life. So it is very important, uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not being uh, instrumental, instrumentalist here or uh, econom uh, economistic, but I think it is important that we we, we appreciate that link uh, that informs um, uh, 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 the superstructure. But, uh, for so that will, that will be my parting shot. That the thoroughgoing transformation of the media is very important, but it must be, it must be linked and it shouldn't be divorced to um, the economic transformation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khatebe. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Khatebe. May I ask uh, Lurato as well to just uh, give us his last comments. Thank you so much, Musidi, and to my colleagues. Uh, it was an absolute honor uh, to have uh, participated in this very important uh, discussion uh, alongside yourselves. My parting shot, Musidi, would be that uh, when ordinary citizens or people who are marginalized feel that uh, they are, or, or at least the, the pressure mounts, they will not wait for mainstream media to give them space or give or, or give them uh, the ability to to voice whatever it is that they are going to voice. Right? The rise uh, of uh, the Daily Vox is an example of that. You know, the rise of an Ushahidi is an example of that. Perhaps the most important thing is now to really uh, obsess about uh, how do we ensure that we don't even get to that point where the rise of such alternative media platforms are more based on a pressure point that got to, uh, you know, to, to, to a boiling point, as, as it were, right? Uh, we need to find a way of how do we make sure that this pluralism uh, is realized, right? Because as, as uh, Dr. Susan of Welsh guided us along, uh, uh, you know, his thesis in, 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 in in this lecture is around we must be more awake and introspective about injustice what it does uh, you know to us but also what the instrument which includes the media and thank you so much Isped, for for you know also gravitating us towards the other side which is the informate infotainment element to say how do we then make sure that we are you know we are able to not wait for like we had uh, you know on july 12th and, and they think this year where we see that people are, you know, at their wits end and they go to the extreme. So, so even with media, uh, my, my submission would be that we should never wait for that boiling point. And then only then we start thinking about media diversity. We start thinking about correcting uh, uh, some of the issues that uh, Dr. Mbofu Welsh raised around representation, both from a, 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 a black people point of view and we and, and, and gender point of view. And the last one really is, I, I worry that there seems to be some sort of despondency uh, from an engagement point of view, right? And and of course, when, when people are in distress, when people are worried about their livelihoods, uh, the, the, some of these things they may not always want to engage in, right? And perhaps one of the things that we then need to be thinking a, a little bit about is now that the you, uh, you know digital media is an enabler, how do we we return uh, we, we return or we create a lot more platforms of robust debates and that are not elitist, that are not uh, uh, exclusive, right? That that are as inclusive as possible, and 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 uh, most importantly, uh, the, 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 these the, these platforms should also be consciousness led I, I i like what for the longest time so had always been right or at least their, their tagline around nation building so so they, they understood that while they were a platform that existed uh, for uh, conveying news and reporting on 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 on, on the the events of the of the day uh, right they also had a responsibility to build this nation and there were touch points that showed that they were and they were intentional in they were intentional in in, in building the nation. So we, we we have to be a lot more intentional if we are to have a thriving uh, democracy that also pays attention to ensuring that we don't leave anyone behind because uh, sometimes access can also make uh, you know put blinkers on us and we fail to realize that there are a lot more there's a lot more that 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 needs to be done. Thank you once again, Musidi, and to the uh, fellow panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Lorato. Um, um, Patiswa, can you also perhaps uh, just give your parting shot before I also afford the opportunity to uh, Dr. Mpufuwaj? 
thank you. Thank you very much um, again. Um, as, as a parting shot, um, I, I do think that uh, we, we, we still need to look at journalism as a public good or media content uh, as, as a public good. Uh, while we acknowledge the fact that it is a costly endeavor and it remains economically inefficient, um, we cannot discount the social dividend that accrues to, um, to, 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 to the public when it's done and done properly. Um, the, the point uh, that democracy, I mean, the quality of democracy depends on the extent to which the public participates in shaping it um, is, is, is true. And that participation by the public requires that the citizens are well informed. And without that information and an intentional inclusion of the dispossessed majority, we have, we have no democracy to talk about. And in fact, what it does, and without social solidarity, it remains an elitist project that serves a few. Uh, and, and these are things that we need to guard against. And back to what um, Dr. Mbofu Walsh said, we, we do need an unapologetic aggression that, that, that will ensure that um, we, we tackle the injustices that, pers that persist in our society. And without that, the, the whole notion of media freedom and freedom of, of expression has no base to operate from. Because if you can't link our prized media freedom and freedom of expression to the public's right to know, um, then it makes no sense that we even have that freedom of expression and that we have that media freedom if it has no relevance for society. Um, and on that note, um, I want to thank um, the coordinators of the session for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your contribution, uh, Mepatiswa. Uh, we are indeed uh, privileged to have um, the SABC in particular represented in this year's lecture. Uh, uh, Dr. Mpofu Walsh, do you perhaps also want to just weigh in? Yes, uh, I think I've I've detained everyone for long enough, uh, so I won't uh, I won't continue the many different directions that this conversation could go. But just to thank everyone for their interventions, thank you for the invitation, and I hope we can carry on these conversations uh, beyond this platform too. Thanks, and uh, my my deep uh, thanks to the Koboza family too. Thank you so much for that. And actually, um, the choice of uh, the speaker in the panel this year was uh, influenced by the young uh, students at uh, UNISA, who are also quite keen to take this conversation further onto social platforms as Twitter spaces. So perhaps uh, we could have a conversation on how we can have this conversation uh, at a later stage this week uh, using that platform. Um, at this point in time, I would like to introduce uh, Professor Siasanga Kiali from uh, UNISA's Communication Science uh, Department. Um, right. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Mokhele. I think that, as I said earlier on, in the last 10 years, UNISA and the National Press Club have also used the event to make a bursary award to one of our honors media studies uh, students who has excelled in their studies. Um, and this year, we are mostly grateful to the UNISA Foundation for their support in terms of the bursary award. This year's winner is Mr. Jordan Scotland Felix. Thank you. Good morning. I am honored to be afforded the opportunity to express my gratitude in being selected as the 2021 recipient of the National Press Club Percy Koboza Bursary. I would like to thank the University of South Africa as well as the National Press Club. Additionally, I would like to thank Professor Van Gas of the Department of Communications for inviting me to apply for the bursary as well as Professor Duplessis of the Department of Communications for his kindness and for informing me that my application has been successful. I believe that it is important to pay respect 
to the man about whom this bursary is named, Mr. Percy Goboza, and his legacy in the field of journalism, as well as his commitment to freedom of expression and democracy. As we commemorate Black Wednesday with the Percy Goboza Memorial Lecture, let us remember a man whose values epitomized and exemplified truth, impartiality, equality, and freedom from suppression. I hope that I will be able to perpetuate these sacred tenets along my journey in the field of media studies. I'm especially touched by the fact that this bursary, which has been magnanimously bestowed upon me, is from an institution of the media industry. This bursary will allow me to continue my tertiary education and achieve my academic goals. I hope that future students of communication studies and media studies will look to the like of Percy Koboza and realize that we as the new generation of storytellers, authors and journalists need to act as the mouthpieces to the voices, narratives and truths of those that need to be heard. On a personal note, I would like to thank my grandmother who sadly passed away a few months ago for her continuous support in everything I did. I thank you once more for this opportunity to express my gratitude and hope that you all remain safe and blessed. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, Mr. Felix. We are now going to move over to a video clip uh, which contains a message from uh, the Koboza family. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity to welcome you all to the 10th Pesit Koboza Memorial Lecture hosted by UNISA and the National Press Club. We as a family like to extend our appreciation to our partners for the efforts that they have made in the last nine years to make sure that this lecture becomes a success. It is a bittersweet moment today, bitter because in and around this date, we always meet as friends, as family, to commemorate the events of the 19th of October, 1979, commonly referred to as Black Wednesday. It is unfortunate that today we cannot meet because of the challenges that we have with the pandemic. So we decided that the lecture will be virtual. We also appreciate all the people of advertising that's leading to the loss of revenue in the printing media. We take cognizance of the threats to the lives of journalists and their families. And we want to retaliate unequivocally our support for journalists who stand up for the right to knowledge, the right to accountability, and the right to speak truth to power. It is therefore imperative that we don't take these rights lightly, but make sure that we protect them all the time. Like I said, we would like to thank once more UNISA, especially the Department of Communication Sciences, the National Press Club, who have been our partners for the last nine years in making sure that we keep the legacy of Percy Sidiso Oboza alive. We take this opportunity to thank everybody who will be partaking in this lecture today, especially the students from UNISA, who are always part of this program and the diverse views that they bring to the debate. We hope and we pray that this lecture becomes a success. And if it changes just one mind, it has done its job for the day. God bless you. God bless Africa. Thank you.
Thank you so much uh, to the Koboza family for uh, that message. We have come to the end of our formal program. And uh, let me take this opportunity on behalf of the National Press Club to first thank um, our uh, guest speakers from our panel to Dr. Bofu Walsh for really delivering a thought provoking a lecture, but also uh, responses that our respondents uh, have also brought to the table. We thank you so much and we hope that uh, should we take this conversation to another platform, uh, we can count on your support to join us. Um, but also let me thank uh, the UNISA and uh, especially the communication science department from Professor uh, Daniel Plessy to Professor Gyali. Thank you so much for having walked this journey with the National Press Club. But our sincere thanks as well and appreciation to the Koboza family uh, who could not uh, be with us on the live uh, virtual platform. But we do express our heartfelt appreciation to them for allowing us to continue to make use of, of, of the Pesit Koboza name in commemorating Black Wednesday. Uh, but also let me thank everybody else, all the role players from the production uh, to the social media team uh, for uh, their contribution as well. Uh, we couldn't have done it without their support. And to everybody else that has been part of this lecture and has been following the conversation and those that have been contributing on the social media platforms, we thank you all. Uh, let me uh, allow me actually to quote from uh, Dr. Mbofu Walsh uh, when he said, we must be aggressive in tackling injustice because injustice was aggressive in its oppression. Uh, this, is, this was our account of celebrating the Pesikoboza memory uh, through our memorial lecture. Um, and once again, thank you to everybody. As we say, hashtag Black Wednesday so that it never happens again. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>